Let's start with step one. It basically starts with having the right idea, doing a business and founding a business. Um, Klaas, um, you just had the idea of founding a steakhouse in Karlsruhe. I did. <laughs> did uh, how come? And, and did your former experiences from doing game companies help you with that? Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that one, but let's dive into the restaurant business for yeah. a second. <laughs> so, it started with, with me wanting to be able to have a decent steak in Karlsruhe. <laughs> and nobody was solving this problem for me, so now I have a steakhouse. Um, of course. Um, and the funny story is that actually it is pretty much the same, but so much more satisfying because you can touch it and feel it. It's, it's tactile, <laughs> right? Um, and just one small anecdote, anecdote towards that. Um, mm -hmm. I met my partner in crime that actually knows stuff about steakhouses other than me. Um, and I met him and I was like, hey, do, do tell me something about the steakhouse business. And he was like, yeah, that's actually pretty easy. I have like 80 seats. They are occupied 1.39 times a day. The average basket size is 74 euros 90. Uh, distributed about the following categories with the following margins. And then we talked for like two hours and he did like A-B tests with different menus and different price points and different treatment through his staff. It's fucking incredible. It's basically e-commerce just with food. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the funny thing is that Kai, Heiko, and yourself, you, you founded your first game companies nearly at the same time, beginning of the century, 2002, I think, was you, Heiko, and 2003, GameDuel and uh, GameForge. Um, did you f find some similarities, or is, is it always the same founding a company? You, you founded Flag Games afterwards, and you found at Vuga in 2009, is founding always the same on, and having the right idea always the same or has it changed over the years? Yeah, if I can talk yeah. about GameDuel, I would say it has changed a lot. So when we started in 2003, um, the games market was by far not as competitive as it is now. So we as pretty much non-games entrepreneurs were coming into the market, into the online games market and came with the value proposition of putting something that was proven offline into the online world. Uh, now putting something onto mobile which works on PC or console is not really innovative. It's done so many times. So I think the kind of idea that you have either is totally innovative or different, but most likely it will be rather a combination of things that are already out there and much more important than the idea is the execution nowadays. That's at least what I would say concerning the games industry. Mm. Jens? Yeah, maybe one thing. So before VUGA, I was also involved in startups quite a bit. And I would say in hindsight, maybe the biggest thing for me has been the importance of timing. Mm -hmm. So everybody always talks about an idea, but an idea may be a great idea for half a year, and after that it may not be anymore because either that business opportunity is, is gone or your competition has woken up. So, so I would say for what we did, social games on Facebook, there was this brief window between middle of 2008 till early 2009 where you could found a company where Facebook virality was still there, et cetera. I think half a year ago, sorry, half a year later, I would not be standing there. Because as a startup, you're always inferior compared to all of the established companies, right? You have fewer resources, you are, don't have the connections, you don't have the trust, you don't have the money, you don't, it's di more difficult to attract people because you, your promise to them is I, I will pay you very little and the risk is high. And um, because of all of this, you can only kind of make your way if you do something fresh and different and new that the established ones are not doing. So I would say uh, an idea is not great in an absolute term, timing is, is extremely important. So at the moment, founding a mobile game company, I think is pretty dumb. Um, and there may be things at the moment that are brilliant game idea, uh, brilliant ideas for companies and next year may not be there anymore because the opportunity is gone. And, and I think honestly, the, the timing is pretty bad at the moment because there's not a new platform there. You know, as, as Jens mentioned, we have the Facebook, we have the mobile start, all this kind of stuff. So what, what is the next platform? Is this VR, AR, what, what is it? Yeah? So you have really to choose very carefully if you start a company now, what kind of platform you want to be on. Maybe in best case you're on all the platforms, but that, that's pretty expensive. Um, all the marketing dollars because you have high competition there, you have to spend there. So founding a company today, you have to be very innovative uh, in terms of business case, of, of gameplay models, um, and, and many other stuff. So that's, that's uh, I think, pretty tough today to found a gaming company from scratch. 
I mean, you just did it with yeah. WoW games, uh, yeah, or, or but you know that's, that's you know that's, <laughs> yeah. that's different. I, I have different. I have a different background. Yeah, so from, okay. from from many point of views. Yeah, in terms yeah. of cash, in terms of experience, in terms of, in terms of team, uh, and of term, in terms of business model. Because what we are doing, you no, know, and a few companies in Europe who are doing that at the moment. So for that reason, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity, and that's exactly what I, men I mentioned. Um, that you should choose very wisely what kind of games, what kind of platform you you want to, to go for. How do you do the researching? when preparing or to found a company. Uh, I remember you when founding uh, Flare Games, um, you did a lot of researching and uh, asking yourself what to do and came up with the idea of doing augmented games, which was obviously was a great idea if you asked Niantic now, but at that time you had, to, you had to struggle a little bit with that and you changed the idea over the years. But, so, but can you give some tips and tricks uh, about the research process if you want to check an idea and up, uh, um, when founding a, for founding a company? It's basically about uh, checking if something is out there that works somewhere else or if there are elements that you can combine, if there is an audience for that and if in principle the technology is there for that. So. Um, Basically, we, we started Flare Games with wanting to do our augmented reality games, is what we call it. Um, it. Think Pokemon Go with a crappy game without a franchise, too early and badly executed. That, that was us. <laughs> um, hence, we pivoted the company. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it was execution mistakes, I would say, and the timing wasn't right. And I, I think you shouldn't overthink your research. So when, mm -hmm. when I started Vuga um, for the first, I think, two months, we thought we would do something different. We thought we would do um, a games portal on the web for the silver surfer, so for, for people 50 plus, 60 plus. And uh, one of the first games could be, so with gray hair, and one of the first games could be a brain training game. And as we explored that and started working on the first game, we discovered, well, there, there's this new thing called Facebook. They have a platform that was 2008. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should, we should check that out, and then it kind of happened. So I think you can over-research. I think you should just get going and be able to, to change very, very fast in the early days. But you need something before, before you start. Or just, is, is it enough to just say, OK, I'm, I want to become an entrepreneur and want to found a company? No, no, I think you need to start with something. But uh, um, very likely, you will end up with something different. So uh, come up, start with some, some, something you believe in but be prepared that the end result may be something different. OK. So let's get over to, to step two, assembling the right team. Um, I think we all agree that's a major key point when starting a company. Um, I don't know, class, if it was a, some sort of marketing gag, but you aggressively proclaimed that Flare Games has to become an asshole-free company. When Why become? Yeah, or, or, or is, or is, or um, that's your one of your major goals. So, how did you assemble the the first four to five people for for your new company? Um, I guess it was mainly driven by by two things. Um, the first one is creating a culture that is collaborative, where people like working with each other, um, where people like to come to work and like to achieve things together. And I've experienced environments where just one toxic employee, one asshole in the team ruins it for everybody and that not only harms the company but takes the fun out of it and purely egoistic speaking, I want to go to work and have fun mm. and so I don't want this and it harms productivity as well. And so what we set up from the, right, from the beginning is basically an elaborated recruiting process where we have candidates over for two days of work trial, interacting with a lot of people basically simulating they, them working for us already during, during the period where we pick our candidates for every role, including our cleaning lady that went through that. So um, it's something that really worked out for us. And um, it, is, it is high investment, obviously, but it helps us to discipline ourselves um, in terms of speed of hiring, because it costs a lot of resources. And it makes sure that we pick the right people. Um, in the comp history of the company, there were less than a handful of people that had to go in the probationary period, and I think that's quite a good quota. Mm. Um, the other thing is that I am pretty aware of my strengths and weaknesses, and the people that I work directly with are usually people that complement me there. And that is something that I look for particularly, especially with roles that are 
working closely with me, like my CFO or my main product guy. Mm. Kai, uh, you found Game Duel with together with friends. Uh, so Legend, was, uh, legend says, friends, I would say. yeah, but <laughs> but you uh, also uh, the the roles you each had were, were complementing each other. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the founding process of Game Duel, how you came together? Because you all had previous experiences in other company from the dot com. I mean, I think Boris Vasmut was one of the founders of Do You. Yeah. Um, so how did it come together, and how were you all agreeing on let's do this together? This new adventure. So that was really um, important for us because Boris and Michael, who both were at Duyu, they had gone through the entire dot-com cycle, building a company, several millions burned, mm -hmm. everything crashed. And so they wanted to have something more stable. I had seen something similar at Lycos. So we were like, okay, let's try to build something that is a little bit more longer lasting. I think this component that we liked to work with each other was really important, especially to my co-founder, so Boris, he's all about this. For me, it was much more, are we really adding and is the team professional enough? So in a way, we have different functions and for each function, we trusted each other that we are 100%, we can rely on this person and it's one of the best we know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's even more important nowadays. If you go in the games market, the games market has become so much more mature. The people that are working there have been, become so skilled. So if I'm supposed to invest in a games company really, then I would only look for people that have already built somewhere some million dollar franchises. Otherwise, it will be very hard to get these people into the company later. So they have to be the founders. And it seems to be also that smaller teams, which are highly complementary and highly skilled, uh, somehow perform, can still have a chance in this market. And that's pretty much the only thing. So it's not only the complementary and the liking each other, but also the professional level. Mm -hmm. And I think if these three come together, then you have a good chance. Jens, uh, you did it a little bit differently. I remember that one of your first major <coughs> hirings, uh, the game designer for your first major, or one of your first major heads, Monster Worlds, wasn't actually a game designer, it was Stefanie Kaiser, but came from MTV. What made you, you so sure that she's the one or one key person for your starting team? So I think almost all of the people we hired in our first year were f somehow from our network. And mm -hmm. that is something that I think it's good because it, it, we either already knew these people or we um, kind of had some good references and that shortcuts the, the recruiting process a lot, it's much faster. And also it's much easier to pitch if, if, if you have somebody who trusts you, the pitch of you will earn less money and it's more risky is mm -hmm. easier to, to make uh, in that case than with uh, people you don't know. And the case of Stephanie, um, I just had a very high trust that she would be able to do something new and different mm -hmm. and when we started on Facebook all of it, it turned out in the end all of the companies that became successful there were not really game companies before mm -hmm. so because Facebook <coughs> as a platform was so different and what was important to to become successful there was so different that everybody who had too much experience in games was failing so everybody who had kind of a ton of experience in browser or console was failing because Facebook as a platform was so different. I think it's similar today. If you would start a company on, let's say, Messenger games, Facebook Messenger, iMessage, I think if you bring too much know-how of how things work mm -hmm. and what is proven, you will not be able to do something different and fresh. So our early employees often were not from games, and then over the years, we, we have added way more people with uh, a lot of specific game, game, game knowledge. Yeah. And uh, I think that's actually required in a way. I mean, it's a bit like the first, the guys who started Tesla didn't know much about cars. Yeah. And otherwise, I think it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. You'd need a fresh mind. <laughs> Heiko, you, you, um, were there any lessons learned from Big Point, assembling Big Point and building the team in Big Point that you took over to uh, WoW Games and doing it? Many. All over again, <laughs> all about the major ones or the key uh, points. Many, and I can totally agree what what Viavas just said. Um, so first of all, asshole free company. So I think the culture is really key. Um, every new em employee we are hiring, um, the first interview they have, it's with me, um, just to see does he really fit to the culture, and if not doesn't matter what kind of good skills he has, uh, if he's the best developer in the world, but if he's, if he's an asshole, we don't want him. Mm -hmm. Second one is vision. Yeah? Do they share the same vision, what we want to achieve you know, with the company? Do you have that vision that early on, if you change it after yeah, yeah, one you, month you, or two you, months? Or? Yeah, you, you change it all the time, yeah? but mm -hmm. in, in general, there's something, you know, um, 
to give you a good example, at the time at Bigpoint, we came to a point where it was everything about just building the best games instead of, hey, we have to generate revenues of the game. So it was mm -hmm. just about how does the game look like and is the game fun and we totally forgot the business model and we just hired people who didn't think about the business model and they even didn't care about business model. They even thought that generating revenues is a bad thing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so something like that, asking the people now are fine that we're generating revenues, how we treat our users, do we understand our product and all these kind of things. So it's not just about a big vision statement, it's about what you want to achieve with a company. So that's the other big thing, what we, what we ask. So a little bit like people, sharing, yeah. sharing the same values? Yes, exactly. So for example, what we have, we have every Monday afternoon, we have a big company um, a meeting where we share all the information with, with the people. They know exactly how our P&L looks like, they know exactly what we do with the company, what we want to do, what kind of issues we had on the weekend, and all the kind of stuff. So they have a full information, full transparency, so that they really also can help us to make the company more successful. And that's something what we totally missed uh, in the company with big point size, with a thousand employees. Um, but you can much do much easier if you have just, you know, in, the, in our case, currently 50 employees. Yeah. So we hiring the four or five first people is key to getting a successful company. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, now it's about finding the right investors. Um, Jens, you were one of the startup heroes at that time in 2009 uh, as a gaming company. I mean, you got investors like, like Holtzbring Ventures, you got uh, uh, Ballard and Capital, I think. Um, how the hell did you get them as a gaming company? Um, timing, we, we were lucky in, in regards to timing because um, uh, Zynga had just gotten a lot of funding, Playdom had just gotten a lot of funding, and investors move in trends, right? So, so mm. when there is a global trend, everybody goes after it. And 2009 was a, a time where every VC wanted to get into Facebook games. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, if you look into 2016, almost no game investment has been done by VCs mm. because at the moment it's not en vogue. Um, and in 2009, what we did, I mean, we, we, we started funding from the get-go, uh, from our savings basically the first half year, and then what we did, we were a bit lucky. Um, we created a Facebook page. It was just called Vuga, and we asked all of our friends from the Berlin kind of startup scene to become fans, <coughs> business angels, um, founders, brothers, all kinds of different people. And um, then apparently one investment manager from Holzbring saw in, the, uh, in their Facebook feed, we recommend you like Vuga. It's 200 fans, but like 40 from your network. <laughs> And they were like, oh my god, what is this? And then they clicked on the common friends and was just, just friends of us because we had been active in the Berlin startup scene since a long time. But those 40 people were investors and business angels, etc. And then before we had even started anything in terms of pitching, I got a call, hey Jens, can we still get into the round or are we too late? And uh, that's so we were just lucky. Okay. Um, how was it with Game Duel? I mean, you all, you, did you, or do you think that, um, Having experience at former dot com companies helped you with getting the f getting the funding for Game Duel. Um, maybe in the sense that we know that we knew where we were getting ourselves into. So in two thousand and three, this was not the time to get money for anything on the web, mm. and we still wanted to have money for the web company. I think we were even the first company founded after the big dot com crash mm. um, with the internet. So I still remember when we went somewhere, they, the first question we see is asked, haven't you read the signs? Aren't you, why aren't you in the consulting or banking, what usually people do in your position? And so we said we were just passionate about it. And I would say it was very difficult. So at that time, nobody wanted to invest. So it was not in the trend. But I think what finally convinced uh, Holtzbrink, in, in our case, Holtzbrink and Borda, two major German media companies, was pretty much the value proposition. So there was a similar model out there in the US mm -hmm. and they had played it and they somehow got addicted. So in a way they liked it. They played it themselves in the office. And, and then they saw us as a team with a lot of experience. And here I think you are a little lowballing. I mean, you are very, you were already a very senior product guy when you founded your company, which probably contributed to the interest of investing. And that was also the case in our case. So we brought a lot of experience, startup experience, corporate experience. And that was probably the only reason why they in the end said somehow, okay, maybe they can make it, but it was very tough. And I would say the size that we got at that time nowadays is done by angels. So 
<laughs> it was, but you also needed less money because the market was a lot less competitive. But uh, coincidence, we do have at least, uh, I know, two angel investors here on stage with, 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 with Heiko and, and Klaas, um, who actually do funding. Um, and so, so how does a startup actually find you and approach you and what do you look for? Network usually. So okay. through people that I know. Um, mm -hmm. And there are basically two things that I look for, teams. So is the team great? Are the people complementary? Do they have the experience? Um, have they done something like this before? And uh, the second one is it has to be a product that I understand. So one way or the other, I end up in games again. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. OK. Is the time for getting investors over in the games industry? Or is there, are there still investors to be found? It's tough, I mean, honestly. Okay. Um, if you, it's, it's as it always is. If you don't need money, you get money. Um, <laughs> when, we, when we were raising with, I mean, back, back in the GameForge days, and we were lucky with regards to timing as well, and the whole uh, gaming started to pick up in general, um, investors were chasing us because we weren't, we weren't needing the money. Mm -hmm. um, and we ended up uh, having Excel Partners as an investor. Mm -hmm. And they are quite a good one, I would say. Um, and so that, that was nice, and uh, it really helped us. Um, and then with the second company, it was really easy. It was basically like, whatever you are doing, we want to invest. Mm. Um, and so uh, we ended up working together, and Excel is invested in Flare Games as well. So uh, sh should you start founding a company if you anxiously need investor capital? Or that, that's exactly what I just want to say. Um, I think it's, it's pretty hard if you just have an idea of a game. You just have a PowerPoint and maybe some artwork, and that's it. Um, then it's pretty tough, you know? um, because it's not just about the developing the game. It's also about the marketing behind that and the maintaining of, of, of the game. That's pretty expensive. Yeah? That's the reason why companies like Flare Games publish those kind of games, and because this is the maybe even at the end the most difficult uh, thing. What I've seen in uh, um, in terms of um, funding of companies is when they have something. Uh, in the direction of how do we know exactly how to do the marketing, how do we get the user acquisition done, how do we monetize the user, so if you have a clear view on the business model. But the most people who want to do games are just in the games. They're just games guys, yeah? and they mm -hmm. don't think about the next step. Um, that's very often what I see in pitch decks. For that reason, um, I don't uh, invest very often in, in, in gaming startups, to be honest. Yeah? Um, for example, with myself, um, I also raised some, some money for my new, new company. Not that I needed it at that time, but I just wanted to have some business angel in my board who just challenged me and asked questions. He is one of them, yeah, but um, who just helped me to, to get a better understanding uh, what's going on in the market and ask the right question and, and something like that. For that reason, it's good to have angels board. So whenever you start a company, just don't think about the money. Think also about the support you get, the knowledge you get, the network you get. So don't ask all the time for high variations and you, I need from you half a million, million or whatever, maybe just ask them, hey, I give you maybe half a percent of, your, of, of my company, but I want you on my board. I want your support and your network. So exactly what Jens just said, it helps if other investors sees that there's a good person maybe in the, uh, in, in the company involved who's helping them to make them successful. That gives much more confidence to the investor that this company can become successful. So building a network is key. For and just one second yeah. to add that, that's why Heiko is on our board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's vice versa. Yeah. Jens, you had another ad uh, addition or something you learned from, from Google? Ju just, just a quick remark. I think um, for one thing that's obviously important, you should not expect your investors to pay for you in your, in your first year or two, right? So I think that's something that you should, should always be ready to, that maybe the first year don't, you don't have any salary and after that it's low. So I think that's kind of some personal investment and sacrifice that everybody um, has to be able to make. And then after that, in terms of is, is v venture capital investing dead for game companies? It has become much, 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 much smaller. Mm -hmm. But I think there are new funding sources, right? If you're really great, you can go to class and he may, may fund your game potentially. Um, or, well, Supercell has talked about doing games investments. There are some other corporates who are funding small uh, new startups. So I think venture capital at the moment is very hard, but there are some other sources out there. But I think these days you can just build your first version kind of on your own, and you, have, <coughs> you kind of have to do that to prove um, before you can get any investors convinced. It all comes back to the good old publisher model, huh? 
<laughs> okay. So now we have our funding, and um, we are all uh, completely ambitious in the first year, have our high goals, and then some t at some crucial day, reality kicks in. Um, and I think we all agree that the second project is always the hardest. The first one is always a, where you have the great idea and everything works out, and uh, then you need the, the second one, which is nearly as, as successful. Um, I think Flare Games is a, uh, is a perfect example of, of building or ad adapting to that. But, I mean, Game Duel, is, it's there since 2003. It's doing, and you're doing social games for... 14 years now, before f Facebook even invented it. So can you give us some insights how you build up that on that core value of bringing people together on the internet and always sticking to that through all the ups and downs? So um, it's not 100% true. We had a slightly different vision at the beginning because okay. what our vision was, and it is indeed true, I thought we didn't change our business model, but we did. Our original idea was, since we were no games guys, we thought, okay, let's just build a platform and let's get game developers on there, mm -hmm. and then let's, let's make them tournaments, and if this works out, we might extend it. We thought even about doing challenges in fitness clubs, whatever, so mm -hmm. lots of stuff at that time. And then we found out when we talked to developers, to really experienced guys, that we always had to give them a lot of advice, because at that time it was not common to do analytics, so there was this game guru who knew how to do a game, mm -hmm. and then we would go back and say, listen, our users don't really like it, can you change that and that and that? And he's like, what the hell, you're not even game developers, what do you know? He said, our users actually tell that, try it out, he tried it out, it worked better. But we found it was so cumbersome that we actually decided to build games ourselves and we're doing better, or like <coughs> games we developed ourselves uh, were doing really well. And so, yes, it changed quite, quite quickly. The, vi the vision that we had at that time was bringing people together like uh, to, you know what, make make competition and inspiring and rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. And it changed now to getting people together with games. So there is still this bringing people together, but it changed quite consistently from very general platform to specific games. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the main points of, of building a business is company growth. Um, you all have your experiences with that. You all, I think you all have or had companies with several hundred employees. Um, can you give us some tips and tricks on how to get this growing thing right? I think, uh, especially in the games industry, which is such a volatile business, it's even harder. Um, are there some, some, some lessons you might want to share with us? So in terms of company culture and, and all of this? Yeah. Um, yeah I, my, what I've seen over the years is that company culture is really how the, the top people behave. That's your company culture. It's not what you write on, a, on something, what you write on a paper or what you put on the wall. It's really what the top two, three, four people in the company, how they behave, that is the role model for everybody who reports to them, and that's the, then your company culture. And um, I think you can do that very consciously. So for example, we decided from the very beginning we want a, a very international culture, we want a very open culture, and we want a very high de degree of transparency and we want to have very open communication. And that's something that I always had in the back of my mind and with everything we do, we kind of put that into practice um, with everything. It was like kind of a hundred things at the office <coughs> and, and what we do. Um, and there are other companies where maybe it's we want a very competitive environment where everybody uh, kind, of, kind of only the, the strongest survive or there can be uh, well, like a, I mean, there, there are some companies from, from the U.S. also very successful who make this analogy of we're like a professional sports team, and if you if you make it to the to the starting lineup, uh, then we support you, and otherwise you should maybe go to a different team. And so, so company culture is really, I think, you as a founder should be conscious about that. Think about that. What kind of com culture you want? What fits to your personality, and what you think will drive success? And have that in your mind and then execute and behave according to those principles. And then that will translate through the whole company. And you can support it with lots of different measures and small things, but I think that's, that, that's mm -hmm. the key. Okay, how are you able to maintain that when you have to grow fast? 
I mean, you, there, so, are, there have been some phases at Gameforge and, and, and Big Point and Vuga as well, where you hired a lot of people, or had to hire a lot of people within yeah. short terms. Maybe, maybe just two things I can say. We, we made one decision very, very early on. We said, no matter, at the end of the first year, we said, no matter how well things are going, we will only double every year. Mm -hmm. So in terms of headcount, no matter what, I think we were 30 people at the end of the first year, including interns. And we said, by the, at the end of the next year, no matter what happens, we're a maximum of 60. And, and we actually stuck to that and slowed down uh, growth a little bit. Um, because with that, um, at least half of your employees are there for about a year. Mm -hmm. And if you grow faster, then um, only a third or a quarter of your employees are there for more than a year. And then you're basically dealing with an assortment of new random stuff instead of adding people to your culture. And, um, the other thing is we, we spend quite a bit of effort on kind of things like starter sessions. So uh, we, do, we still do that, still today. Every few weeks uh, we do starter sessions. I spend about two and a half hours and all of the other key people uh, from Vuga spend half an hour or an hour giving an introduction to the company and uh, explaining to employees what's happening. So I think those two things can help. I think we did a big mistake at, at a big point, you know, mm -hmm. driven by all the opportunities we have seen there, yeah? So, you know, started with browser games for free to play, haven't seen what's going on on Facebook, okay, let's go to Facebook, oh, there's a mobile opportunity, you know, let's go mobile and let's do MMO, let's do single, let's do casual games. Even we thought about skill gaming, we thought about so many things and it's hire people and, you know, do you have ever heard about a PHP? Yeah, you get a job here, start to develop a game, yeah? So <laughs> something like that, that happened uh, just by all the opportunities and all the revenue, the profit we could generate at that time and you thought okay it would be a big mistake not investing and growing yeah that was our thought at that time today I know much better and we are now much more careful with hiring as I said we are very picky um, with, with many things and we don't to and do any compromise in terms of quality um, skill set and, 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 and personality etc and now we are growing slower um, but I'm much more as a founder as a, as a CEO of a company I'm much more happier with the team I have today and it doesn't matter if it's just 50 in case so, um, if it ever happens to become again a thousand people company, which I don't hope, and I'm fine too because when I just hired a thousand good people and not just because driven by enough opportunity hiring developers, artists, or whatever. Okay. Yeah, same as Jake here. I mean, yeah. in the year of the most aggressive growth, Gameforge went from 180 to 460 or so in within one year. Month. Yeah, well, wow. okay. Um, that didn't turn out that well. Um, and we did it without management in place or processes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and it was opportunity driven, as Heiko described. It was basically turning stones and, oh, another gold mine, oh, another gold mine, oh, another gold mine. We are so smart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. At uh, Game Duel, at least from my perception, it was a little bit different. You had a much th slower growth. Was it a conscious de uh, decision, or um, so we didn't make any uh, guideline like not dub more than doubling? I'm not sure what really happened. But what I realized is, up to 80, we actually grew very organically. We had always very strict. So that was probably one of the outcomes of our first startup invent adventures, mm -hmm. where, where you are right now already at, at the start of Game Duel. So we said we don't want to hire people just for hiring them, we really have to be sure they add value and we don't have more work with them after we hired them than before. I mean, that's an easy thing to do. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, it, it slowed down our growth just naturally up to then. What I found really challenging is as soon as the company became bigger than for us, it was like 100, 120, mm -hmm. then you really have to shift the entire mode from like working directly to <coughs> building systems, automating things, and the entire culture changes, which is kind of hard for a founder who likes action, who likes to have direct impact. And I think this is where we struggled the most, really um, learning that you also need to hire a different kind of person for this kind of job. You need different, some of the people grow with this and become your extended arms, but some just don't live up to this challenge. You have to get them from the outside and they are kind of different people than the ones you, at the, you, you have to hire at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that took us a while to understand. So this was our cultural difficulty. Like these people then feel really bothered by a founder who comes in every time, like, hey, look at this great opportunity, gold mine, let's go. And they're like, come on, please let me build up my system so your company is still there tomorrow. Yeah. And that, that starts at a certain size. Yeah, that somehow, so thank you for that uh, <laughs> point because it brings us to step five, um, adapting to an ever-changing market. Uh, I mean, 
most of you um, are, or the companies is in a different state or doing di different di uh, business with, uh, compared to what you started with. And uh, I think Flare Games is a perfect, because really obvious example. You started as a developer, and now you're focusing on publishing. Or, uh, we even started as a developer for this augmented reality yeah. thing, and then turned into a f developer for free to play, and then kind of a developer and publisher, and now a pure, pay pl a pure play publisher. But, but wasn't that a very hard process for the, the, the company? As a, uh, from the, we talked a lot about values, about hiring uh, the right people, about culture, and you have to say, okay. Um, was a nice idea, but we have to do it all differently now. It's what happens. Yeah. I mean, okay. of, co of course it's hard. Yeah. Um, if you want it easy, go find a job as an insurance company or yeah. at a bank. Um, it is hard, is it challenging? Uh, it, you question yourself and your team and they do the same. Um, but it is a necessary thing for the company and the people prospering. Mm -hmm. And everybody grows with every pivot okay. because you learn something new. Is it possible to, to, to Get, uh, get this process right with the same kind of people? I mean, uh, Jens, you perhaps you can sh share some thoughts about that because you had to change from a growing Facebook market to something completely yeah. different. So, so I think our change from, from Facebook to mobile, it was the same people, um, mm -hmm. but, but it definitely was not trivial. So for us, what we did, um, we thought, hey, mobile is the next big thing, and we thought hey, HTML5 would be the technology. We really bet on that um, dump in hindsight, but in 2011, that was kind of a, a fair opinion to have. And we realized about af after half a year or so that that was the wrong direction. And then we went into native for iPhone and then later to Android. So I think you always have to keep your eyes open, always question what you're doing. And um, I mean, for me, I, I made this decision to go after HTML5, and a half year later, I had to stand in front of the company and say, hey guys, I, I told you this would be the future. I was wrong. <laughs> um, we will go there now. And um, yeah, that's, that's not trivial. But I would say, in, in this market, you always have to pivot and you always have to change direction. But at the same time, you also have to keep your revenue streams, right? Because your, our revenue streams from Facebook were funding our mobile development. And uh, mm -hmm. so you have to find the balance of keeping still attention on, on the old business, because that's funding the development of the new. And if the new fails, you need the old. <laughs> and uh, doing both of, of them at the same time, making the right trade-offs, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. OK. How much harder is it in the games business compared to other business to adapt to the market? I think adaption is always hard. The frequency of adaptations and new things happening on, on mobile is just significantly faster. I mean, think back 10 years, and back then it was uh, console, browser, MMO, uh, Facebook, mobile. That's the last 15 years or so. So five major new things or growing things that were like the hot shit where money mm -hmm. went into, where people founded startups and companies and were successful. And I mean, five major shifts in 15 years, that's quite speedy. Yeah. What, uh, how, how was this process at Big Point? I know you had, a, you had a huge core gamer focus in the beginning, and then it spread up. It suddenly spread into yeah. all major directions. And uh, w with success as well. I mean, uh, like uh, uh, with the, uh, the farming game was very successful. Famarama. Famarama was very successful. So you, you had your successes with different directions. But was it too fast at that time, or? I, I just said to class, yeah. I never pivoted, so I don't know. But now yeah. I'm, uh, you, you drive me in the direction. But no, <coughs> at, the, at the end, what the idea was, at, uh, what, what I said at, what was the topic four? Yeah. Opportunities. Yeah? So we have just seen what's going on, on on Facebook. We have seen what's happened at Farmville. But we have seen that in Germany, there's still an audience um, which is not on Facebook, is not playing on Facebook, which we can go for, yeah? with especially the marketing opportunity TV. Yeah? So we do a lot of TV promotion to get a different audience than you can find on, on Facebook. And for that reason, we brought Farmarama, and we're very successful mm -hmm. with that. So I think Big Point was very driven by just opportunities we have seen, as Klaas just said in every 
few years, there's a big new thing in that market. That's what I, by the way, really like in this industry, in the gaming industry, that you can invent all the time new stuff. And you're not in the insurance, banking, or whatever kind of business, where you do all the time the same thing, you just call it differently. Here you really talk about different platforms, different technologies, different business models, and all this kind of stuff. And that makes it really fun to be in that business. Doesn't matter how hard and how challenging it is, it's a lot of fun because you learn a lot and you do every day something new. Okay. What was the hardest adaption or for, for Game Duel? Yeah, I would say it is the change from pretty much, I think every of, of you had that at some point. Similar, like you, from the web, like pure PC focused, really nice revenue model to a more mobile environment. Mm. Because there we realized that mobile is actually a console business. So you need a totally different set of skills. You need a very high level of technical standard. So when we had our web business, I think um, we had the, the standard for development was just the, what was required from a developer, from a Flash developer, was not comparable to what is required now from a mobile developer. And the Resulting development cycles, I think this is the thing that took, took us, at least me, the longest to understand that now a game doesn't take three months anymore. It takes now one or two years, and that is actually what it takes, even though it looks like Candy Crush. Mm -hmm. and, and you're like, what? why do you need so long for this? Now I know. But at that time, I thought we have to be faster, and Zynga showed it, right? On, on web, they were very fast, but the shift to mobile actually showed that you need to invest much higher quality, and you need people that actually have a very high skill level of understanding before where to go and why you do certain things which become visible a year later. And that's very hard for member, team members to understand that are used to testing something on the web and seeing that it works or not. OK, that brings us to our last step. If it is one, but th I think that's one thing you always hear when founding a company, you need an exit strategy or think about an exit strategy. Is that actually true? Um, honestly, I think it's bullshit. Um, there are plenty of founders who approach it like that. I would never do it. Um, I'm always up for building something that is unique, that makes a difference, that has a place in the market, that has a defendable market position, and that has things that you are better in than the competition. And if you have that, there will be an exit, or an mm -hmm. opportunity for an exit. If you take it or not, it's a totally different question. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe you're just fun, have just fun doing what you're doing, and that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, I would never build a company to exit. Okay. What about the investors? Do, do you need to have an exit strategy for them? So I'm, I basically agree to class. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would, would maybe add is if you have venture capital investors, their business model is that some of their companies will, will grow in value 10 times, 20 times, or 100 times. So um, yeah, obviously, they, for some companies, they need to sell at very, very high valuations. But I think as a founder, you should really focus on building a great and big company. Um, and if you don't have the ambition to build a big company, don't take venture capital. But um, if you have that ambition, I want to build something really big, you can take venture capital and then focus on that. Don't, don't focus on your exit strategy. OK. Kai, you're doing this since 13 years now with the same company. Doesn't it get boring? Um, because it's the game industry, no. Okay. Because there are so many changes. So I've been asking myself this question, but it's actually a very different business we are doing nowadays than we have done six years ago. And uh, in terms of um, exit, I would agree to your extent. So the question is, who, who wants to exit? So there are two exits, the exits of the investors. And there you have to have a strategy. You have to tell them something which mm -hmm. you believe at the time and which changes as the business changes. Um, but at the same time, the exit strategy for the entrepreneur is, let's say, death at some point. <laughs> and you want to be sure that the business is then running without you, right? So that is the thing that you at least should care about as an entrepreneur, that at some point, if you really, for whatever reason, don't want to do this business anymore, that it can run without you and that you have a product that is in the market and continues to live. You're long -term okay. Very um, long term. <laughs> Heiko, I, I don't know if it's fair to call you a serial entrepreneur, but you, I know that you have several business, businesses running. And um, do, you, do you need a special mindset to do that? Or is it a smart idea? Or, uh, because it's a little bit different from, from what other, other person said, because you, you can just can't, can't handle only a few companies. Uh, being CEO of a company is quite a job, I think. 
normally. So wh why do that, or uh, is this, what's the idea behind that? Honestly, my, there's just one company I'm really focused on. Okay. Um, I'm invested in other companies, which I'm maybe supporting a little bit more, but I'm not in the management, operative management, management team. So what I'm doing uh, is really focusing on, on a company I'm mostly invested in and I'm believing the most in. And that's exactly a gaming company. That's WoW Games currently. Mm -hmm. So, um, but to be, be straightforward, um, I, I absolutely think it's wrong to found a company with a clear goal to exit Mm -hmm. Even better, I did that. I started WoW well just to sell the company at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, to, be, to, be, to be very, very open. Um, and everyone in my company knows that. Whenever I hire mm -hmm. someone and whenever we talk about it, everyone knows exactly. We even have, have fixed the date. We said, okay, this is uh, roughly the year when we want to sell. So that everyone knows exactly what is the goal of the company, what do we have to achieve for that. We have milestones for that and all the kind of stuff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So but that's a clear strategy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, why do I do that? One thing is because um, I like to build successful companies, and I like that they survive for a long time, and I get bored very fast. So, okay. and running a company, big point was the longest thing in my life ever. Uh, I, I even had not a girlfriend for that such a long time. Yeah? So, and that's really pretty unique for me to run a company okay. for such a long time. Yeah? So, um, that's, that's something what, what I want to do. I want to run, start a company, run the company, sell it, or give it to a, a different management team and, and start something new again. So I think I will be an entrepreneur for the rest of my life until death, um, but with different kind of companies as I'm running right okay. now. Cool. So last question. Perhaps it would be great if any one of you can give an answer to that. From, from your pers personal perspective, what's the best thing in being a founder? And that's the first one. And the second one, um, what should be or what's the major skill that you need to have when you're thinking about that or founding a company? What's I think the, the best okay. thing to be a founder is to be free, freedom. You, mm. you make the choices. You, every day you decide what you want to do. Um, but what's the second question to do there? What, uh, from your personal perspective, is one the major skill set? Skill, skill, skill yeah. set of Execution. 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 Um, if you are just someone who's a good talker, that's nice, then you know, go somewhere else, um, but don't run a company. Be an executor and get shit done. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I second on the first point, so freedom or, or being the master of your own destiny, as I like to call it. Um, not, take, not picking execution, which would have been my first pick as well. Uh, I would add self-awareness about your strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. uh, so that you can build the right team, that you know what you are good at and focus on that and find help and the right people to supplement you in the things that you just suck at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kai? Yeah, so what is the cool thing about it? I think for me it's uh, seeing that you can make a difference in the market, that you offer something that makes people happy. So for games entrepreneurs that's really fun because it's usually millions of people if you just imagine how happy and, and if you didn't just meet one of them and see how excited they are and then you multiply it, it's just, so this is what I like. Mm -hmm. And in terms of skills, I think it's also adding to the two shifting context so as especially as a founder at the beginning you have to always shift between minute operational detail and strategic thinking within minutes because there is nobody else there that will bridge the different levels and so that's something that founders have to bring to the table okay Jens? So in terms of skills, the first two things that came to my mind were execution and self-awareness. So um, <laughs> I, I will not come up Bam. with something extra. <laughs> and uh, I think of, of what's the best thing about being a founder. To me, I think if I look back, it's kind of a form of self-expression. Mm -hmm. So where, where others do do other things, maybe maybe an artist can, mm -hmm. can do some music or can some can, uh, can create some picture, uh, I'm, I'm unable to do it, so it's a kind of a self-expression of turning things that are in my head into a reality and into something tangible. That's maybe the, the best thing about it. Okay, cool. Thanks for your answers and for your tips and tricks and for time. So do you have ad any additional questions you would like to ask these guys? Hello. Thank you very much for the talk. That was really insightful first perspective uh, information. And I was wondering, I specifically recruit in help mobile gaming studios in San Francisco and New York um, and build out their teams and I usually partner with overseas studios when it's like maybe one to, to five to ten people still on the ground and I was wondering how much do you let you know, let's say you're hiring in a manager and you already have a team of producers and such and you're hi hiring the EP the executive producer how much do you take into account 
the team's opinion of that person who will be coming in to manage. Because right now, as I work with startups, there's some that say everyone on that team must say yes to that potential manager or else we're not going to get him or her in um, because that could dismantle then the team below. And I was wondering how, mu how much do you let that you know, opinion count? For Flagrams, the answer is pretty easy, um, everyone. So what we do is when we hire somebody is build a group of stakeholders that uh, co accompanies that person through the whole hiring process and all the stages. Um, and that's usually uh, the future boss, colleagues, peers, and all direct reports of this person. Um, and in the end, after the work trial with Flare Games and presenting the findings and answering questions and meeting a lot of people, uh, the stakeholder group decides whether we hire or not, and one no is a veto, whoever it's coming from. Um, we, we hire sometimes people with one no, but in general we try to avoid hiring managers for an existing group of people. So if possible, we try to have the managers in really early and then put people to the team um, because usually I think when you put, a, put in a manager, especially when you replace a manager, that's often changing the team a lot and, and I think it's really, really difficult. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but we try to, to not do that if possible. We also spend a lot of energy asking the opinions of everybody and what we are asking is pretty much what would you re recommend to the manager should be done with this person and their team. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more open and if we get a no there, we ask the person, do you object that we hire this person? And then if there would be still a no, then we would not hire, but we would hire with some no's like I can't recommend him because I'm not the manager or because I don't like the person, but if the manager thinks it's the right person, I won't object. Mm -hmm. So there are different kinds of vetoes, and so the soft no, we actually s would, still, <laughs> would still hire if the rest works. Soft no, that's... And we have a soft no and a hard no, and the hard no is a veto. I'll dot <laughs> that for my team, that's awesome, okay. Um, did you give shares to the first um, employees that you have, and how was your experience with that? Would you recommend to do so? We have an options program for everyone who works at Flare Games, including our cleaning lady. Um, most people don't see the value in that, to be honest, especially when you are looking, I mean, funny enough, it slices by the geography the people are coming from. So the Americans, it's the first question. Uh, <laughs> for the Germans, it's like, oh, paperwork, do I have to read this? Um, what's the value? It's not worth anything, right? Um, but I believe in aligning interests, uh, as we do with developers, I want to have aligned interests with, with all our employees. And if the company is doing well, they should be doing well as well. As I said, I've, I've built the company to sell it, to, to have an exit, to motivate the people they should participate on that. So of course, everyone has opportunity. We have once a year, we have feedback talks, and then we talk about salary raise and all the kind of stuff, and we gave them all the time opportunity. Do you want a raise in cash, or do you want um, shares? And, and I have the same experience uh, with like, like class, um, but most of them, they um, uh, like to go for cash instead of the, the shares. Yeah, so we have a very similar system, the choice between cash and shares, because we wanted people to appreciate what they get and not just say, oh, you throw the shares after me. And so after a certain, so at the beginning, I think we did a round where everybody got something when we still hired the cleaning lady ourselves. <laughs> but at some later stage, we pretty much, uh, the salaries became so competitive at some point that for some people, we didn't uh, really see the need to give shares on top. And we said, hey, you can take shares, but if you don't want to, we can also pay you more money. For us, it's like Flare Games, shares for everyone, but no, obviously not the same amount for everyone, but everybody has shares. Okay. Okay. Ben, thanks again for your time. Thanks for listening, and uh, have a great evening. Thank you.